Yeah. Wait till he. All right, let us know. Go ahead. Hi, I'd like to welcome all of our food farms and chefs to join us and introduce you to Adam Volk, who is from Red Crest Fried Chicken. And Gene, take it away. So, you know, in America around holidays, the summer season, we talk about, you know, the great American, you know, burgers, you know, apple pie, things like that. But I'm going to make the argument that there is probably nothing more American than really delicious fried chicken. And everybody's heard me talk about fried chicken before. We have had some of the great fried chicken in the city on before. But, you know, a little place that recently closed, and we'll get into those circumstances, that will be, you know, starting up again uh, in Philadelphia region. You know, Adam Wilk, who has Red Crest Fried Chicken, originally out of the Brooklyn area. Adam, welcome to Food Farms and Chefs. Um, you know, sorry to have the loss of what is certainly in the top three front, you know, chickens in the city of Philadelphia, arguably the best. You know, that's a tough loss for all of us, but we're so excited about what's to come. So welcome to Food Farms and Chefs. Thank you so much. Uh, excited to be here today and Definitely sad to see, uh, you know, Red Crest Fried Chicken close, but it was uh, it was the right decision when we had to make it. It was abrupt, but um, it was the right decision, and it'll just kind of allow us to take a step back and gear up for the opening of our new restaurant, which will uh, will incorporate Red Crest Fried Chicken uh, into the property. So excited to talk to you today about that, and excited to do, uh, just have a chance to talk about food in general. So Adam, why don't you take our listeners a little back, back to, you know, your story you opened up in Philadelphia in 2018, uh, you know, obviously going into the pandemic and all, but you know, doing okay. Tell us a little yeah. bit about, you know, how you got to where we're at today. All right. So um, I moved uh, back to the Philadelphia area. I'm originally from, from the area here. I met my wife in New York uh, uh, almost almost 20 years ago now um she's originally from south philly and after we had our son we moved back to philadelphia uh we were kind of trying to figure out what my plan was i was commuting to brooklyn uh three days a week to still work at my restaurant there i was also hoping to open a restaurant up in the catskills inside of a, a renovated hotel uh up there called scribner's catskill lodge so i was kind of spreading myself thin we had a new new son and um you know i just come from this background of you know a little bit more involved uh full service restaurants fine dining and i started seeing you know these like kind of interesting business models of the quick quick service restaurants popping up here and there and there was one up in the catskills that just really caught my eye and as i was sitting and designing this schedule with you know 28 people on it and our our weekly payroll was tens of thousands of dollars and i was watching this little tiny restaurant crank out burger after burger after burger and milkshake after milkshake with a staff of like six people and it kind of just made me ask what what i was doing you know why am i sitting here developing this menu or this this uh the schedule with just so many moving parts and then there's this thing in front of me that's just it was you know, it was one of the spots in the in the town that had really good Wi-Fi, so I'd go work there often, and uh, I was just watching it, and it, it kind of dawned on me. So, I came up with the idea for Red Crest Fried Chicken while I was literally driving back and forth to the Catskills. I found this space on Passionk Avenue. Um, it was a previously had been a Chinese restaurant. They closed. There was like not even a for rent sign on the on the door. I I filled out or I wrote a little letter to the landlord and dropped it in the mailbox, hoping that they would find it. Uh, he called me a few weeks later. Um, we signed a lease. Uh, my father-in-law and I did most of the renovations on the space. And then we opened, as you said, uh, was that February of 2018, Thursday, leading into Super Bowl weekend when the Eagles won. So that was an insane weekend to open a fried chicken restaurant in South Philadelphia. Um, and then, you know, we, we were doing really well. Uh, we, we, 
broke ground on a new location of Red Crest Fried Chicken in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And we opened in late November of 2019. Um, And I think everyone knows what came next. Uh, COVID hit us just as we were kind of getting moving that following spring. We wound up losing that location. Um, I put everything that we had in a storage unit down here in Philly and was looking for a new space to open up a quick service spot here using the equipment that we had just moved from Philly or from Brooklyn, I'm sorry. Um, were introduced to the location of the uh, previously the Bainbridge Street Barrel House. Um, the space was offered to us with the liquor license uh, at a really good rate. We signed the lease on July 5th of 2021. July 25th of 2021, there was a catastrophic water main break, which filled our basement with over 100,000 gallons of water and took a turnkey restaurant back down to uh, bare studs in in about 50% of the restaurant. Uh, So that was a devastating setback. Um, Been fighting with uh, insurance companies in the city, et cetera, which we can go into detail if you'd like to talk about, but then kind of got things rolling there. And then that brings us to 2022. Our lease is up on the Pashunk location on July 1st. Um, And just with the, the way things were going and the rents increasing, uh, we kind of just took a step back and said, you know, we're spreading ourselves thin. Labor, labor is really hard to come by right now. Um, our new location is twice as much space, twice as much usable space with a liquor license for almost dollar to dollar the same as, as our lease on Passion Avenue. So um, we decided to take a step back from that. Um, and just with a lot of repairs that needed to be spent on the building and putting money into a building that was not ours, we made the decision to um, to just say goodbye to that location for the time being. So uh, we closed a couple weeks ago. We're cleaning out there, uh, and we are steady rolling getting the new location open, which will be at 6 in Bainbridge. You know, restaurants open closed throughout the city of Philadelphia, and unless you're a uh you know, a big name drink Perrier or, you know, a Gorsuch or something like that. Very seldom does a restaurant closing, you know, get the press and the PR that, you know, Red Crest closing really did. You know, Michael Klein and other, you know, writers and, and columnists in the city talked about it. It really had an impact because a lot of people, I think, in, in my opinion, felt the hardship that you were going through here is somebody who came through COVID who is trying to do something really wonderful, bring, you know, this, you know, nice sit down dining experience with great food, you know, uh, stepping up and having the liquor license. And all of a sudden due to circumstances way beyond your control, this happens. And then you just get mirrored in the, you know, legality of what the city will do and how they will happen, you know, how they will help you. And, and, you know, the total, in my opinion, failure of government, you know, that Mm -hmm. something like this could happen and they could really walk away and, and just, you know, barely be penalized from a, a financial point of view. So, you know, Red Crest really did reflect a lot of our views about how hard you work and how hard this industry does. And I have to give you tremendous kudos for picking it up and moving forward. A lot of people at this point in time would have just thrown in the towel and say, you know what, I'm going to go to the office. But that's not who you are. You are are a food person. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there are days where I think, man, I I wish I had just taken a job working for somebody else, you know, and and I, I think I've just worked for myself for too long to really be able to do that anymore. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, spoiled on the when, you know, when I want to make a decision, I make it and I, I carry it out. And, then, you know, sometimes when you work for other people, you might not agree with their decisions. And it's really hard uh, after being self-employed for so many years now that, to uh, to just accept things like that, you know. And I, I did work for a few people in between 
leaving Brooklyn and, and opening in Philadelphia. And it was, it was difficult, you know, even though they were some great employers, it was just still a really hard thing. So I guess all that being said, it's just, it would be hard for me to one walk away from this business that I've been working so hard on for the last, uh, you know, last six years now, um, since we, you know, kind of started the ball rolling and formed the LLC and put together all the the business plan and started the fundraising. Uh, and the other end is, you know, I have responsibility to my investors and, um, you know, some people that really believe in me that are friends, family, and some strangers. And, you know, I feel inclined to keep pushing as hard as I can, uh, to return that, you know? And I think one last thing, sorry, one last thing for me, that's really important too, is just to create, to continue creating environments that are, are like they're positive work environments and positive workspaces, because there are so many bad jobs in this industry throughout, you know, all all sectors of the industry and all states and cities that it's whatever we can do to kind of move the move the uh move the ball forward on creating these like better work environments is, is another really big thing for me so the labor market is something we could talk about for hours and hours and hours and it's exhausting mm-hmm. i i spent my entire career in this industry uh both back of the house and in front of the house and you know things that are going on today in the labor market you know um, I was talking with a, a good friend of mine right before, you know, we started this interview who owns a very established business in the city, a couple locations. And he said, you know, his fry cook came in today and said, I need three dollars an hour more. And I want you to guarantee me 10 hours of overtime every week. And, you know, he turned around, and he says, so you're my fry later cook. You do wings and fries but you want $60,000 a year. I can't actually do that. He says, well, you know, I have an offer doing that. That's the force of the labor we have right now. That's what we're dealing with. And, you mm-hmm. know, people leaving on short notice at all. So I applaud you for wanting to step up and make a difference and, and yeah. you know, get those right people. It's a difficult fight. Well, I think, I think what we're seeing really in a, in a big way right now is, is an overcorrection of, the atrocities that have been committed in this industry for so many years and everyone being over or underpaid, overworked, uh, you know, not being taken care of, be, people being taken advantage of. Uh, it, it's just, it, it was a nightmare industry to work in. And I feel like things were starting to get better a little bit. Um, but, but now we're seeing the pendulum swing in the opposite direction in such a hard way that it's like, it's kind of shocking, but you know, it's just, we, we have to change the way things were. And I think what we're right now is what we're experiencing is just like that really hard swing to the other direction, which is again, sure. like it's, it's, it's overcorrecting, but we're moving towards the direction we need to be working in. And I, I can't blame people for, for, uh, you know, asking for what they're worth. Um, and we have to figure out a way as, as people, as industry professionals and leaders and, and business owners figure out a way to make it work. So it's yes, not it's easy, a, but it's a, big, it's a big fight. So let's switch to the very positive. We're looking at uh, sometime in September for the opening of Redcrest Kitchen. Yep. Tell us a little bit about what that's going to be, your menu, um, your <laughs> service style, everything yeah. about that. So, um, so as, as I said earlier, you know, we, we were looking for a quick service location kind of in the University City, West Philly area, maybe up near Temple, kind of had a few spots we were looking at. And then um, the broker we were working with, uh, Vincent Stippo um, from MSC, he said, oh, meet me at six in Bainbridge. And I said, well, that's one, that's too close to Red Crest Fried Chicken uh, in a neighborhood we don't want. And two, you know, like that space is huge. And then he said, but it has a liquor license. And I said, but sign me up, put in an LOI today. So, I mean, I, I looked at the place before it was on the market and I, I walked in with, with absolutely zero desire to operate in that environment, in that size space. Uh, and then when I, w- I walked in and just saw how well the place was built, um, you know, it's just a really, really nicely built restaurant, a really nicely built space. Uh, and I was like, eh, it's a little intriguing. And then he said, it also has a liquor license. And I said, okay, where do I put my name on the line? So we put an LOI in that day. Um, 
we took a few months to get the get the paperwork you know worked out um get the contract contracts worked out and um so you know our intention originally was just to open a neighborhood spot um you know we're going to use red crest kitchen as the name just to kind of keep brand recognition we feel the red crest the name has has done well so far for itself so um but we wanted to mirror the restaurant that I'm a partner in, and I was the uh, you know founding chef of in Brooklyn called Esma. Uh, it's E S M E. Um, that's in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and it's just a neighborhood restaurant. Uh, we kind of go with a casual but correct concept for uh, style of service and style of food. It is very much a casual neighborhood restaurant where you can feel comfortable going multiple times a week, take a date. Take your friends, your your parents come to visit, you know, but service is still correct. Wine service is correct. You know, we clear plates. Uh, I'm sorry, we clear uh, silverware in between courses. Um, you know, our our staff is well versed on the menu, so it's like a nice balance of a casual restaurant, but you're going to get really phenomenal service, um, and the food is going to be you know, really well done, but it's not going to be too precious. Um, you know, we, we don't spend too much money on, you know, garnishes because then I don't have to put a couple dollars extra on each dish because I'm, you know, getting foraged greens or, or microgreens or something like that. And while I, I absolutely love that food and I love that style of dining and I love that style of cooking, I just don't want to offer that here. You know, I want to have a spot where we're not, not tacking on a couple dollars to our, our, steak because we're using a really really precious you know microgreen or something like that wonderful i you know to me you've always been and what i got out of red crest you know good simple food done really well thank you thank you, you. Know, that, that means a lot you know it, you know you you took the time to execute the technique, you took the time to go to the extra step and do it correct. Uh, something that is often lost today in a lot of mm -hmm. businesses. Everybody thinks they can be, you know, the next chef, and they didn't have the upbringing or the experience to, you know, master the simple things. And mm -hmm. and you, Red Crest did that so well. I mean, it made a yeah. name for themselves doing that so well. Um, Tell us a little bit about some of the things that are going to be on the menu. Um, so, you know, I, I guess what, one thing that we're going to do, which is interesting, which I'll, I'll delve into a little bit here, is we're going to be running Red Crest Kitchen out of out of the out of that space, right? But concurrently, we're also going to be running Red Crest Fried Chicken for delivery and takeout only. Um, and so you'll be able to to download. We have a mobile app which we've been using for a while. Has like loyalty points and whatnot so you can actually like you know get um you know you can get like money back on your orders sure. uh but you can you can order you'll be able to order for takeout which you'll be able to pick up at the bar or for delivery uh which will only be available through our our mobile app or our website we're not going to be doing any third-party uh caviar or grubhub etc we're going to try to steer away from those those businesses um so that'll be running while we're there. So you'll be able to get all of the Red Crest fried chicken food delivered to your house still. The menu for Red Crest Kitchen, as I said, we want to do, you know, casual but correct kind of uh, kind of menu. Um, we will have stuff on the menu like, you know, we're gonna have like whole whole wings. So it'll be like a whole chicken wing served with either a salsa matcha sauce or tossed in a dry uh, salt and vinegar rub. Um, another dish on the menu that, that I've been working on at home right now, which has been kind of fun um, being able to subject my family to these things is um, doing a burrata with um, blueberries, Thai basil, um, and, and like a sweet preserved uh, Serrano chili. Um, we also on the menu, uh, one of the, one of the dishes that I really, really love right now, one of the entrees, it's DS served really nice and crispy uh, with white uh, mackerel. I'll either use marrow beans or uh, just like a white great northern bean. But the northern beans are cooked with chards. Um, and then 
the onions and they're taken out and pureed. And cooked beans are folded back into that and finished with white miso butter. And then pickled white onions and then just like a little bit of like a kind of like a spicier green, either like um, you know, mustard green or, or watercress or something like that, just to get a little bit of a bite. So um, it's a really, really simple dish. It looks really pretty. Um, but yeah, that's like one of my favorite entrees that we've got on the menu right now. I love how you say it's a really simple dish. I'm sure many of our listeners <laughs> are like, huh? And <laughs> it, it really is. And the flavor, as you were describing that, I could taste that just yeah. the individual flavors blending together or what that would be. Well, you know, taking that little time to pull the beans out or the onions out and puree them and add them back. Mm -hmm. You know, those little steps that are just, you know, impacting the flavor so strongly. It's yeah. absolutely well, amazing. I guess when I say simple, it's it's that the, the techniques are <laughs> simple enough, but it's also the flavors are really simple. Like, um, you know, and we, I one thing that I really, I picked up at, at one of my jobs that really kind of, blew my mind with cooking was just the, the layering of, of flavors, like, you know, like using, using this consistent items in, in dishes, you know, like, um, uh, it's another fish dish, but I used to do, um, uh, Chilean sea bass and it was served with, uh, sauteed, you know, caramelized cauliflower. Um, and then the sauce itself was a sous vide, So an onion puree sauce. Sure. But all the scrap from the cauliflower, when you broke down the cauliflower, all the stems went into the sous vide. So it was a really background flavor of cauliflower. It was not very prominent, but it was just a little bit in the background with, with the sous vide. So as you're eating everything, you get these layers and layers and layers of flavors that, that you might not even pick up on, but they, they make sense and they, they mingle really well. And they, they're kind of just in the background, they're working together. So. Uh, and and I was just it was an interesting in, interesting insight that, that I was able to think of my old jobs. And and that is something that so many young chefs are getting out there don't understand yet. Uh, you know, they go for a, a big impact, they go for a big, you know, forward flavor kind of thing. And, and even some winemakers do that, mm -hmm. but you know, they they miss that layering opportunity to you know make a dish so memorable and you know to me that's what comfort food is mm -hmm. you know good comfort food when you can take simple flavors and you know layer them and build them you 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 are on to success my man you are you know <laughs> i cannot wait till september now to be able to come down and and try some of this food i want to touch mm -hmm. on something else we talked about a little bit about your tie to the community you know, a lot of people, when bad things happen, the first thing that they do is, you know, they go out and say, who could give me for free or who could do this or who could help me out here? And you reached out to the community um, in something I'm pretty familiar with, which is the Honeycomb credit campaign. So rather than just, you know, reaching out for anything from the government or going through all that, you brought on a series of private investors that mm -hmm. while they don't have equity, they, they have interest in your business and, you know, you're signing off on making sure they get paid and, you know, and it's a good interest rate that, you know, they're getting back, they're getting a good return. You know, why didn't you go to traditional SBA or, you know, looking for, you know, money and through the government and things like that. And what made you decide on going to Honeycomb? Well, I, I think that, you know, um, I can speak to that in a bigger picture kind of way, which is that, we, you, you know, something I recognize very early on in my career is that the community is the people are, are who supports me as a business owner. You know, I'm not, I'm not getting money from anyone else. It's the people in my neighborhood that come and eat at my restaurant. They tip my staff. They, they, you know, I'm going to feed them and their family and they are going to keep my business moving and help me pay my staff. Right. It's, it's, I can't exist without them. Um, they can eat without me, but I can't, I can't eat without them. Um, so it's really important to me. And, you know, community in general is, is, has always been a big driving force for me in, in pretty much anything I do, whether it's, you know, politically or business minded, or just, you know, where I choose to spend my money, I try to spend it 
in the community. Um, so much like the reason that we're getting away from these third party delivery companies, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want somebody placing an order with me and then 30% of that order, the money leaves our community and goes to another city and another group of investors. So moving to this, you know, my, our mobile app, you know, that, that money, we pay a small fraction of, of that for processing fees, right? And that, that does leave our community, but all the rest of the money stays here. I, I, I can charge less for the food. So it keeps more money in your pocket. You're able to get some money back in the term of loyalty points that keeps more money in your, your pocket. So keep, you know, it's a closed loop economy. It keeps money in our system. Um, you know, the, the delivery drivers who take the food, the tip goes to them. You know, the percentage that I'm paying for delivery goes to them. Um, and that's just so when I found out about, um, it really made sense to me. You know, it, it, it's, it's a way to have people invest in our business. It's not, like I said, it's not equity based, but it's, it's debt based uh, interest in the, in the business. So the way it works is uh, you can invest whatever amount of money into, um, into our business through Honeycomb. Uh, we pay the loan back over five years. Uh, we, we have a 10.25% interest rate. Um, the money we pay, we pay it to Honeycomb quarterly, or I'm sorry, monthly. And then all of our investors get a quarterly uh, distribution. So, um, you know, if we let the loan run the full five term, the five year term, then we wind up giving everybody back about a 30% return on their investment. So if you put in a thousand dollars, you'll get about 1300, a little over $1,300 back. Um, so, you know, the interest rate is a little bit more. Um, but one, it's, it's a quicker turnaround uh, to get involved with Honeycomb from the day we signed up with them. We went through the application process to getting the money back if we do raise the full $70,000 is about 60% faster, 70% faster than going through the SBA style loan. But also it keeps the money in our community. The money that's being returned to interest is going to members of our community and to some of our customers and to some of my friends and family. Uh, and I'd rather give that money to them than give it to, you know, enter whatever name of whatever bank you want to. And, and you know, here, I don't want to get anyone. So. So now having a liquor license is going to be a little bit different from you uh, or different for you. So tell us a little bit about what we might expect at the bar there. Um, well, so, you know, we, we're going to, the space had 25 lines, 25 tap lines. So we're going to cut that down to about eight, eight beers on tap. Uh, we're going to have a few cocktails on tap. Uh, oh, we're going to have, what's that? That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So we're going to have probably three cocktails on tap. Um, one of them is, is, um, is called the, the Papacito number three. So when we took over our restaurant in Brooklyn, it was called Papacitos and it was like, a kind of neighborhoody, you know, Mexican restaurant, but it was um, kind of like a hipster Mexican restaurant. They had a lot of vegetarian and vegan food there. Um, quality was, it was okay. Um, but so when we, when we started uh, Esma, I really wanted to put a draft Paloma on the menu. Um, I just thought it would be a great summertime drink. And so we called it the Papacito and it's gone through now two different iterations. So this will be the third version for, for the new restaurant, um, and then we'll have uh, we'll have Rival Brothers is going to be doing our coffee program, so we'll have Rival Brothers cold brew on draft for me, pretty much specifically, um, just so I don't have to <laughs> leave the building to get my coffee fix. Um, and then we'll probably have a you know a rotating selection of cocktails. Um, the opening menu I've designed just because uh, from my background I I have worked with cocktail programs before I worked at a restaurant in Brooklyn called Gwinnett street and the program that I was involved in, there was three bartenders that did all the drinks, uh, myself included. And we actually got nominated for best new restaurant program at tales of the cocktail for 2012 for best restaurant bar program. Uh, we, we lost to the nomad, which sure. was a pretty, pretty amazing program. Yeah. So even to be nominated yeah. next to them 
was such a cool, cool experience. But um, so I, I've taken some of my favorite shit from that menu and just given them a little bit of an update. Um, and then just taking some other one from friends and just kind of put it together. So, um, you know, so I, I put that together, you know, as we, as we hire staff and find, uh, sure we'll work together with them so that cohesive program that makes sense with our food. Uh, but you know, we'll give up that control pretty much to the else. Uh, and then as far as those, it's going to be a really simple menu, um, probably, you know, everything's going to be by the glass available. I don't think we're going to have like a big, big selection of bottle only. Um, and it'll probably be, you know, three, three whites, three rosés, three reds, a couple sparkling. I'm um, going to just keep it really, really simple, straightforward. So as we wind up now, we're coming close on time. People want to follow and find out when the restaurant's opening. What's the best way to do that? So we are on Instagram uh, at Red Crest Kitchen. Also at Red Crest Fried Chicken. Uh, those are our two Instagram accounts. You can also find um, us at Facebook. And if you just put in Facebook forward slash Red Crest Kitchen or forward slash Red Crest Fried Chicken, you'll also wind up at our, uh, at our Facebook pages. Redcrestkitchen.com is the website for the restaurant. Uh, it's right now, it's just a placeholder. We don't really have much there. Um, and then uh, redcrestfriedchicken.com is a is a the web's website for the Red Crest Fried Chicken. There you can find a link to our online ordering platform as well as a link to download the mobile app. Uh, you can find a link to the Honeycomb campaign. We got about a week left. We're about two thirds of the way through the campaign. So if you are hearing this and it's something you're interested in, go check it out. There's a link to it in all of our Instagram accounts. Uh, my ins my personal is at at Adam Volk, um, and you can find a link to it there. Um, on any of our websites, you can find a link to it there. We've we've pretty we've made it very easy to uh, to find a link to the Honeycomb campaign. You can also just go to honeycomb.com, uh, and you'll be able to or honeycombcredit.com, and you'll honeycomb be able to find a, a link to it there as well. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you back up and going uh, early this fall. Cannot wait. And I will certainly be one of the first customers coming through your door. Very excited um, to, you know, see you moving forward. Thank you for joining us on Food Farms and Chefs. Thank you, Adam. Yep, thank you so much. Thank Sorry. you, Adam. Hey, Let's take a, little, a break, Kim. Little we'll glitch there at the end. I hope you got the rest of that. Yep, we got it. To become a sponsor okay, of our show and have your business or event promoted on every single podcast platform, two Philadelphia radio stations on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. evening drive time, an FM station in New York, and to the millions of Facebook users worldwide with access to the Facebook mobile app. Send us an email to either foodfarmsandchefs at yahoo.com or diningonadime at yahoo.com.